In this video, I'm going to go through review two for the coordinate geometry uh, unit. So for number one, segments A, B, and C, D are parallel. Remember, that means they've got the same slope. So if C, D has a slope of two-thirds, then the slope of A, B must also be two-thirds because I know parallel lines have the same slope. That's just a fact you got to know. Similarly, for number two, it says, which of the following is the slope of a line that is parallel to A, B, given that A is 5, comma 11 and b is 14 comma negative 10. Well, all I'm going to do here is just find the slope between a b because that should be the same as any segment that's parallel to it. So if I do my change in y, negative 10 minus 11 over 14 minus 5 to get negative 21 over 9, um, I notice I don't see that in my answers here, but I could rule out 3 and 4 because they're not negative. Um, you could type this into your calculator to reduce it, or you could recognize that they're both divisible by 3. And if I divide negative 21 by 3, I get negative 7. And if I divide 9 by 3, I get 3. So my slope of something parallel to AB should be negative 7 over 3. For number 2, what is the length of the leg of a right triangle if its hypotenuse is 12 units long and the other leg is 8 units long? Well. Um, I know what a right triangle looks like. It has one right angle. So I'm going to do my favor and just sketch a right triangle there. I know only one of my legs. So I'm going to label one as x, the other as 8. My hypotenuse always goes across from the right angle. So I'm going to draw my 12 right there. So this looks like a good old Pythagorean theorem problem. Where a and b are my legs and c is that hypotenuse there. So I'm going to label as x squared plus 8 squared equals 12 squared. x squared plus 64 equals 144. And if I subtract 64 on both sides to start isolating that x squared, I get x squared equals, uh-oh, 80. The reason I say uh-oh is because I know to undo the squaring of x, I'm going to have to take a square root on both sides. Now you should already be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, that's not a perfect square. So if I'm looking at my answer choices, it looks like I'm probably going to have to break it down. So remember, the idea is you want to pick the biggest perfect square that divides evenly into 80. Perfect squares are numbers like 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, etc., etc. Uh, because that happens when you square those integers there. You know, if you're asking yourself what squared gets you 16, it's 4. So uh, 16 is a perfect square. So I already know that I could break down 80 into 16, that's the biggest perfect square that divides into it, and 5. And the reason I do that is because I know radical 16 simplifies to 4, and radical 5, I have no idea what that is, so I leave that as radical 5. So really, in simplest radical form, the length of my hypotenuse should be 4 radical 5. Now, a couple of notes. What you could check in your calculator is that 4 radical 5 and radical 80, if you type those both in, all I did was simplify, so they should have the same decimal value in your calculator. Also, a quick calculator tip if you want to use it, if you're having trouble factoring 80, you could go into y equals, type in 80 divided by x, and if you really want to, you could go to your table and what you would do is you would check to see in your x and y value tables uh, where your biggest perfect square is so you'll notice uh, next to the 5 is 16 so 5 times 16 gets you 80 and 16 is the biggest perfect square you'll see if you scroll around in that table there so that's just a quick tip for your calculator for number three a circle has a center located at negative 2, 4, and there's some point on the circle with the coordinates 4, negative 4, and it wants to know what the length of the diameter of the circle is. Uh-oh. Well, if I connect the two points I have, I just have the radius. Um, so what I could do is I could find the distance between those two points and just double it because the diameter is the whole distance across the circle so that's twice the radius 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug into the distance formula. If you don't remember, that's x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. And I'm going to start making substitutions. So I'm going to label maybe this is x1, y1, and this is x2, y2. Again, it does not matter which one you pick to be which. Uh, so I'm going to make my substitutions. x2 is 4 minus negative 2, which just becomes plus 2, plus y2 is negative 4, minus y1 is regular 4. All right. And remember, when I'm simplifying this, I always like to plug in the number under the radical first without the radical in my calculator. So I get 100 under the radical, and I say, hot dog, that is a perfect square, and that simplifies nicely to 10. Now be careful, that d represents distance, not diameter. What you found was the length of the radius there. And the radius is only half the length of the diameter. That whole distance is the diameter there, so if I double 10, I get 20 for the length of my diameter of this circle. Number 5. Segment EF has those endpoints. If a horizontal line is drawn through the midpoint of EF, then what is its equation? Alright, well the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find the midpoint, right? Remember the midpoint formula is the average of the x's. So x1 plus x2 divided by 2, comma, the average of the y's. And remember, it's always okay to get decimals here if, it does, if uh, you don't get a nice integer. Uh, but let's see what happens. If I add my x's, I get 5 plus 9 over 2, and 11 plus 21 over 2 for my y values. 5 plus 9 is 14, divided by 2 is 7. 11 plus 31 is 32, divided by 2 is 16. So what this represents is the midpoint here. Now, a couple of things you should know. This point is, let's say, somewhere way over here. That's not drawn to scale, of course. I want the equation of the horizontal line that passes through that point. If it's a horizontal line, all of the y values are the same. Um, and I can simply look at the y value or the y coordinate of the midpoint to say that, well, if 16 is one of the y values, because I'm not moving up or down, all of those y values must also be 16. For number 6, this looks to be a hefty one. Triangle ABC has vertices with those coordinates. Prove that triangle ABC is an isosceles triangle, but not an equilateral triangle. Oh boy. So remember, an isosceles triangle has two congruent sides but an equilateral triangle has three congruent sides. So I want you to think to yourself, how would I show anything about the lengths of the sides if they gave us all three points? Well, we have a formula that would help us get the lengths of all the sides. That's the distance formula. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the distance for all three sides and try to make an observation. So if I plug into the distance formula using points A and B, that's my x1, y1, and x2, y2, I'm going to do this real quick just to show you what happens. I'm not going to plug in uh, the radical into my calculator, just the number underneath, to see that the distance between A and B is radical 26. I'm going to do that for each of my sides just to see what happens. So the distance between B and C, if I do that, should be 0 minus 4 squared plus 4 minus 0 squared. Again, I encourage you to pause this video and try it on your own because I know I'm doing this a little fast. And I want you to see if you get the same answers as me. I get the distance between B and C is radical 32. And the last side, I'm going to look between D or A and C. Excuse me. 4 plus 1 squared. And if you're wondering how I got that, I used A as my x1, y1, and C as my x2, y2. And again, if I simplify, I notice something interesting. I get radical 26 again. So even those aren't, you know, integers, they're rational numbers. 
that's still showing you that AB is equal to AC. Um, so that's showing that since AB is equal to AC, that means therefore, those three dots, therefore, triangle ABC is isosceles. So that's the first thing they wanted me to prove. The next thing they want me to prove is that it's not equilateral. So notice this sad, lonely radical 32. He is not the same as radical 26. So since BC does not equal either AB or AC, triangle ABC is not equilateral because not all three sides are the same. So if I got radical 26 for BC as well, that would be enough to prove that it's equilateral because all the sides are the same length. Number seven, determine the equation of the perpendicular bisector, that's two parts, of KL. If the endpoints of KL are negative seven, five, and nine comma one. Right, so just to give myself an idea, you don't even need to use the uh, graph here. I'm going to do it again just to organize my thoughts. There's two things you gotta remember here. If I'm looking at a perpendicular line, remember the perpendicular lines have negative reciprocal slopes. So if I could find the slope of KL, I could just take the negative reciprocal of that and that would be enough to find the slope of the line that I'm looking at. But remember, you also have a bisector. And a bisector should go through the midpoint of whatever segment it's bisecting. So if I find the midpoint of KL, that's definitely one point on my line. So I'm going to start just by finding the slope using the slope formula. Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus x1. Again, if you're subtracting a negative 7, you best make it plus. 1 minus 5 is negative 4. 9 plus 7 is 16. And if I reduce, I get negative 1 fourth. So the negative reciprocal to that negative 1 fourth, or the slope of a line perpendicular, would just be 4 over 1, or just 4. Either of those mean the same thing. Now I also need to find the midpoint. So I'm going to take the average of my x's, comma the average of my y's. So that's x1 plus x2 over 2, comma y1 plus y2 over 2. Now you should have this formula memorized, so I'm not going to leave it here. I'm just going to substitute my values in. So if I average the x's, it looks something like this. And if I add my y's and divide by 2, I get something like this. Negative 7 plus 9 is 2, divided by 2 is 1. And 5 plus 1 is 6, divided by 2 is 3. So that's my midpoint of KL. Now you could always count slopes to find that on the gra graph, but if I plot that midpoint, I'm going to call it M, it should look like it's right in the middle of your segment there. So that could be a good giveaway if you made a mistake at this point in the problem. So, let's think about this. I have a slope of my line, and I have a point of the line, and I'm tasked in writing the equation. Well, I've got a point, and I've got a slope. I can plug in a point-slope form. Remember, that's y minus y1 equals my slope times x minus x1, where that just represents any point on the line, that x1, y1. And I know a point on the line, the midpoint. Because if it's the perpendicular bisector, it has to pass through m there. So I could plug in my y coordinate there, which is 3. My slope is 4, or 4 over 1. And my x coordinate is 1. This is a perfectly acceptable equation of a line. Resist the urge to, you know, distribute the 4 and add the 3 over. This is perfectly acceptable. If I wanted to sketch this, just to check myself, with a slope of 4 over 1, I would go up 4 from m over 1. I could also go down 4 from m left 1. Down 4 from m left 1. I'm doing this just to, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, just to confirm that I have the right equation of a line. Looks like mine's a little off, but it should be okay. 
right? So mine's a little sloppy, but you can see it looks like it made it to a right angle and passes right through the middle there. Number eight. The endpoints of GH are those. Does the point 15, 1 lie on the perpendicular bisector of GH? Well, remember how we did the last one where we found the negative reciprocal slope and the midpoint so that we can get the equation of the line? I'm going to start there, and then I'm going to plug in the point to see if that satisfies the equation. So this is going to be a little bit of work. First thing I'm going to do is find the slope between points G and H. So if I plug into the slope formula, 17 minus negative 3, which should just become plus, over 8 minus negative 2, again, be careful there, just becomes 20 over 10, and it simplifies nicely to 2 over 1. The reason I leave it as 2 over 1 is because it's easier for me to figure out how to flip that fraction and change the sign. So that's the slope I actually care about. Right, now I'm just going to find the midpoint here using the midpoint formula, which is the average of my x's, negative 2 plus 8 over 2, common the average of my y's, negative 3 plus 17 over 2. If I do a little bit of simplification, uh, negative 2 plus 8 is 6 divided by 2 is 3, and then 14 divided by 2 is 7. So I have a slope, and I have a point. I'm again going to plug in two point slope form. y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So y minus my y coordinate, which is 7. I plug in my slope, which is negative 1 half. And my x coordinate of the point is 3. Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to plug in the 15 for x and the 1 for y. And I want to see if this point is on the line. So what I'm going to do over here, just give myself a little bit more room. I'm going to do 1 minus 7. And I want to see if it's equal to, right? I don't know that it is, so I'm going to put a question mark there. Negative 1 half times my x value, which is 15, that I'm substituting in, minus 3. So let's see what happens here. Negative 1 minus 7 is negative 6. Let's see what that's equal to. 15 minus 3 is just positive 12. Um, if I multiply the negative 1 half to the 12, half of 12 is 6. And if I multiply negative to a positive, it's negative. So because that point, when I plug it in, satisfies the equation, Yes, it is on the perpendicular bisector, because that's the equation of the perpendicular bisector. And any point that satisfies that equation must be on the line. For number nine, describe a sequence of rigid motions that would map triangle MNP onto triangle EFG. So this onto this. Now there are so many answers that you could pick here. Um, so I'm going to just use the knowledge that we've learned this unit, the new stuff, and say, well, wait a minute. It looks like if I reflect it over this line, y equals x, it might get this a lot closer to being over here, and maybe it would fix the orientation so they'd be oriented in the same way. Now, I don't know whether that's true. This is kind of like an educated guess. And that's what these uh, sequence of transformation problems are. Take a couple of educated guesses and see where they get you. So I'm going to start by translating these points, or uh, excuse me, reflecting these points. So from N to my line, it's up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I'll put N there. And I'm going to continue that process. For m, it looks like instead of 8, it's 11. If you want to know how I did that so fast, I just saw that this side was 3 units in length. So that side should also be 3 units in length. And for p, it looks like it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And if I go 14 over here, oh, I'm such a good counter. Uh, p prime should be over there. 
And again, I know that because I've done this ahead of time, so I already see where it's going to go. So this is a little bit of trial and error. So I'm pretty close here. I'm not exactly where I need to be, but I am uh, pretty gosh darn close. It looks like if I just slid it back, I'd be in business and the triangles would land right on top of each other, right? Just to show you, if I slide it back some number of units, boop, they land right on top of each other. So you just need to count the boxes. In this case, I need to translate a direction. I'm going to say right. And it looks like if I'm counting four units, would get it to map onto each other. And again, there's so many different things here. You could do a, a rotation, a reflection, and then a translation, or just a rotation and a reflection. As long as you're specific, you know, make sure you've got details there. If you're rotating, tell me how much, what direction, over which point. So if you want me to check if your transformation is right, just let me know in class and we can go over it. Number 10, a little bit of a throwback. Which figure has exactly four lines of reflection that map the figure onto itself? Well, triangle has three sides, octagon has eight sides, rectangle doesn't have four congruent sides, but a square, remember a square is a rectangle with four congruent sides. That has four lines of reflection right down the middle there, right down the middle there, but also along the diagonals. So that's a regular polygon with four sides. Similarly for a regular octagon, that means all the sides are the same, that would have eight lines of reflection, and an equilateral triangle would have three. Number 11. What are the coordinates of A, which is at negative three, negative two, after a reflection in the line Y equals negative X? So you gotta know what that line looks like. It has a slope of negative 1, a y-intercept of 0, right? And it's going to go just like that. y equals negative x. So if you remember, I am a man of structure, and I like rules. And the rule for y equals negative x meant to send a point of x comma y to negative y, negative x. So if I apply that rule here, I would swap my coordinates and change the sign of both of them. So if I change the sign of negative 2, I get positive 2. And if I change the sign of 3, I get positive 3. So if I plot that 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, I get a prime to be over there. Alternatively, if you wanted to do this graphically, you could count how far A is in the vertical direction and just copy that distance in the horizontal direction. So that's a, a quick trick to do it on the graph if you're in a pinch and you don't remember the rule. Number 12. If segment CD has those endpoints, determine the length of CD to the nearest tenth. So this is simply an application of the distance formula. Labeling one point as x1, y1, the other is x2, y2, and substituting it. The only thing you need to be careful here is with your signs, right? When I subtract that negative 5, I will tell you a thousand times, just write it as plus. You'll normally see me just write it as 2 plus 5, just to not confuse myself. Plus 13 minus 3 squared. Now, it says to the nearest tenth, so I should already know that when I plug in the stuff under the radical, I won't get a perfect square. And <gasps> I don't. I get radical 149. So I would say D is about, when I just type that bad boy into my calculator, I get 12.2. So notice it's not exactly 12.2, so I don't write an equal sign there, but they did want it rounded to the nearest tenth, and that's the first decimal place. If they want it to the nearest hundredth, I would put a second decimal place there as well. For number 13, a regular decagon, 10 sides, remember 10 sides on a decagon, 10 years in a decade, is rotated n degrees about its center, carrying the decagon onto itself. The value of n could be, well, remember to get the minimum degree of rotation to land a figure on itself. I take 360 degrees and divide it by the number of sides. So in this case, every time I rotate 36 degrees, I'm going to land the figure right on top of itself. So you want to go through these and just check which one of them is a multiple of 36. If you go through them, You'll notice that 252 is the same thing as 36 times 7. So if I spin it 7 times with a rotation of 36 degrees, it'll land back on top of itself. If you try dividing 36 into any of these, 
you'll get a decimal so it won't go in evenly. Number 14. What are the coordinates of the given point? Negative 3, 7, so that's right there. After a reflection in the line y equals x, followed by a transformation of rotating 270 degrees. Now it says the use of the grid is optional. Uh, because if you remember your rules, this is a little uh, easier to organize and less to take in. So I'll show you both ways, right? So a reflection over y equals x, that just means to swap your coordinates. So put the 7 in the front, put the negative 3 in the back. That's a rule that we learned the other day. And the rule for 270, uh, if you don't remember, was take a point and make it y negative x. So that means bump the y to the front to make a negative 3, and bump the x to the back but change the sign. So this is one way that you could do it. Alternatively, if you don't remember that 270 rule, you could take a prime and just do uh, three bump switches, right? So one bump switch would bring the three to the front, change the sign, so that's 90 degrees. Another bump switch would bring the seven to the front, change the sign, bring three to the back. And a third bump switch, so three groups of 90, would bring the three to the front, change the sign, bump the negative seven to the back. So you could also do that if you want to find that point. Uh, graphically, this is a lot longer to do, so I don't recommend it doing it this way. I'll just show you how you could approach it. If you sketch the line, y equals x in there, remember it has a slope of one and a y-intercept of zero. You could count the vertical distance from a to your line there, and then copy that distance, let me just count to see where it would be, this way right here to get a prime. And then you would have to do uh, three rotations counterclockwise, right? So you have to go once that way, another time that way, and another time that way to land at negative three, negative seven. So to me, that's a lot more work but it's really up to you which method you want to do because both of them will land you in the exact same place. Number 15. Segment MN has endpoints there. If MN is reflected in the line Y equals X, followed by a translation right three units and down two units to produce its image M prime N prime, determine the coordinates of the midpoint. All right, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to just state M And n. I'm going to first apply the y equals x rule, which just tells me to swap my coordinates. So I'm going to swap the negative 2 and the negative 3. I'm going to swap the 6 and the 1. Now, from here, I'm going to have to do a little bit more work to translate 3 to the right and 2 units down. A quick trick is I could add 3 to my x values, and if I'm going two units down, I could subtract two uh, from my y values. That's a quick trick that will always work, um, but you could also do it on the graph. So these would be the coordinates of m prime and n prime, but of course they wanted the coordinates of the midpoint. So I would just have to do the average of the x's, comma the average of the y's, Remember, if I add a negative one, that's the same thing as subtracting one. And if I simplify it, nine plus one is 10, divided by two is five. Negative five minus one is negative six, divided by two is negative three. So that's my midpoint, right? That's what they were looking for there. It says the use of the grid is optional. Uh, once I'm done here, I'm gonna show you how to do it graphically, but I'm just gonna keep going with B and then I'll get back to the graph. Uh, determine the length of mn from above. All right, so that's telling me length is just an application of the distance formula. So I'm going to take those two points, and you should get used to seeing this by now because we've done a bunch of them, and I'm just going to plug and chug. So I encourage you to pause the video and make sure you get the same answer as me as you're going through it. I plug in just the number under the radical. I get radical 80. They don't tell me to simplify or anything. Um, so this must be the length of mn. 
Now, it asks me, what must the length of m prime n prime be? Well, you could always uh, plug back into the distance formula with your new points and find it, but I'm feeling kind of lazy. Uh, so since mn equals radical 80, m prime n prime must also equal radical 80 because reflections and translations are just rigid motion. So that's going to be my explanation here. Are rigid motions which preserve distance. Right? You could say distance and angle measure, but really the only one I'm, I care about here is distance. So if I just apply some rigid motions, it shouldn't change where the figure is and uh, how long the figure is, uh, even if it's somewhere different in the plane. All right, so that's the algebraic portion. I just want to show you the graphic portion in case that's um, a little bit more in your wheelhouse. I'm going to do my best to sketch in the line y equals x, and I'm going to go from there. So my original m is negative 3, negative 2, and my original n is 1, 6. Notice I'm using a straight edge so that I'm as neat as possible. And if I want to reflect it, well, m is just one up, so I can go one right to get m prime there. I'll zoom in so you can see. I'm not going to label that as m prime just because I'm going to use that later. Um, and n, if I count, if I go down one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, should be right there. So this is my first image. But now I still need to translate it. Uh, what did it say? Right three units and down two. So if I take this point and go one, two, three, one, two. I'll do that in blue. Oops. One, two, three, one, two. So that's where m prime is going to go, and that's where n prime is going to go. So this would be the way to do it graphically if you chose to do it this way. And you should notice, remember translations, keep segments parallel. So that could be something that could help you out there. And it looks like all these are the same length. So that could be a good way to eyeball to make sure that you at least can mentally check yourself and say, hey, I probably did this correctly.